Hey, my name is Chelsea Fagan, and I'm the founder and CEO of The Financial Diet, a totally independently owned and operated company of women who love to talk about money. Welcome to The Financial Confessions, a weekly show where we talk to people about their personal finances, their professional industry, and how money shapes their lives. You can listen to or watch new episodes of The Financial Confessions every week on YouTube or your preferred streaming platform. You can also support TFD and get exclusive access to our entire catalog of ad-free bonus videos, workshops, Discord community, our book club, and more by joining our members-only community on Patreon or YouTube. Our 2024 goal is to be primarily supported by our incredible community, and joining our membership program is the best way to do that. Enjoy the episode! Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Financial Confessions. When we started sharing late last year that this season of TFC was going to be all with real people dealing with real money issues, again, no slight to the many fabulous, wealthy, and famous people that we've had on this show in the past. They are also real people, just perhaps a bit less relatable. One of the most common topics that was requested was the intersection of mental health and money. Aside from the fact that mental health can often be a debilitating aspect of our day-to-day lives because, among many other things, there aren't often the kind of accommodations that we need to be offering for mental health in the same way there might be for physical health. And let's be clear, even as it pertains to physical health, we're usually not that accommodating either. But many mental health struggles are invisible and therefore often stigmatized, judged, shamed, and above all, placed on the individual to manage entirely. As most of you probably know, even if you are lucky enough to have health insurance, the extent to which that insurance covers mental health care is often extremely lackluster, if not totally non-existent. So whether it's ADHD, autism, PTSD, or any other number of mental health issues that affect many of us in the TFD community, we have been requested over and over to feature someone who can speak candidly to the intersection of mental health and money in their own life. We were lucky enough to be approached by our guest today who speaks very thoughtfully on that exact subject. Her name is Nikita Miner, and she's here with us today. Hello. Hello. Good to be here, Chelsea. Good to have you. So let's just start off. Who are you? Tell us about you. Uh, Well, my name is Nikita. Uh, I live in West Michigan, specifically Grand Rapids, Michigan. And um, I'm living with, I'm living as a person with ADHD, autism, and dyscalculia. Um, I am a poet and a social worker by trade. Can you talk a little bit to to kind of give us the initial framework um, about the process for you of getting diagnosed, but also coming to understand your, um, your mental health. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that for a lot of folks, TikTok is one of those, um, platforms that gets a lot of folks interested in mental health. And I think for me, I've been interested in mental health my entire life. I was that kid who was reading all about, you know, um, psychological disorders at like seven, you know, in like the, the big picture books, (laughs) about um, health and things like that. Um, And for me, I'm actually late diagnosed. So anything after 18 is technically late diagnosed. So I was diagnosed at 29, heading into my 30th birthday last May with ADHD and PTSD. And um, I had an earlier PTSD diagnosis, but it was my first ADHD diagnosis. And I was very adamant on getting a correct diagnosis because in the past I had been misdiagnosed. So I was misdiagnosed and which is actually quite frequent for folks or not frequent, but like is pretty common for folks, especially women, especially black women like myself who are dealing with ADHD, perhaps autism and and things like that. So um, when I was diagnosed at 29, things started to come together kind of like puzzle pieces. I was realizing that everything that I had hated myself for, there was a name for it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just, oh, you're broken or you're um, faulty at some level. It's like, oh, you actually have a neurodevelopmental disorder, which changes the way that you think and the way that you feel about things and even the way that you feel about um, yourself. So I I actually dealt with a lot of self-hate prior to even getting that diagnosis. And over the last year, it's been like trying to love myself in a new way. 
um, love myself for the first time with new eyes, kind of. Can you talk a little bit, um, you know, one of the most common things that we hear uh, from people in our community with ADHD is that ADHD in particular can make managing money feel almost impossible. Um, That so many of the uh, just kind of day-to-day aspects of money management, even at a very basic level, are you know almost like diametrically opposed from how people's uh, brain works with with ADHD. Can you can you speak about that feeling of impossibility? Absolutely. So I'm huge. Like I I listen to your podcast. I love um, Tiffany Alice. Like I am really into money management and budgeting. But even though I have all of the tools, even though I have all of these different pieces and, you know, you should invest or you should, I had no idea how to do all those things because I wasn't able to put them together in a way that made sense. So for me, even something as simple as grocery shopping, like um, I cannot necessarily mentally calculate what is in my cart. So I get up to the register, which is why I always use self-checkout because then I can see what I'm ringing up as I go. Um, And One of the main things is impulse control. So for me, ADHD, I'm both um, hyperactive and inattentive. So I have a combined type. So when it comes to um, like, I mean, even in my bank account, I I don't use cash because I forget what I use that cash for. Mm -hmm. And if I don't keep my receipts, then I have no idea what I even purchased. In terms of your relationship with money growing up um, and sort of unpacking that relationship now in the new framework of your diagnoses. Um, Can you share sort of what your relationship was with money growing up? And if looking back, any of that was perhaps a part of, you know, these neuroatypical diagnoses that you didn't know you needed? Yeah, Um, I think for me, when I think about my money growing up, I always tended to hold on to money because at some point in time, maybe my mom would need it for gas or something. So my money never really felt like mine. Um, when I Even when I started working, uh, that money was just funneled back into the household, right? Um, and I like to say that I was middle class for nine years. So there was nine years of quote unquote bliss, but we kind of had to trade that for living in a household that was like less than healthy, um, should I say. So on the tail end of um, like my, on the on on the tail end of high school, we were back to square one in poverty. And prior to that, we were on section eight and had food stamps and things like that. You know, I, I actually studied social work because of my experience growing up, um, you know, very low wage, like very much so like um, my mom was living paycheck to paycheck. She got married so that we would have some stability, which we did have. But again, there was that trade off of like safety and even like emotional health. Um, So when she was divorced, we ended up back, uh, like I said, at square one, like not having anything. And so there's a lot of trauma around money because I have had absolutely nothing. And I've been homeless with my mom. I've been homeless with my siblings. And then there's the um, opposite side where like I went to a private college and people there just didn't worry about money in the same way that I worried about money. Um, At least the majority of students didn't worry about money in the same way. Uh, So it's kind of been like a learning curve trying to understand how I, I feel about money. But the basis of it is like when you don't have enough you feel like you will never have enough and Mm. um with ADHD I've always felt like maybe it was just my fault that I never had enough you know maybe it was something wrong with me for just being um I don't like to use the word poor but I understand that that is like easy to comprehend you know you mentioned that you experienced homelessness with your mother and your siblings um I think a lot of people have a very narrow and often inaccurate perception of what homelessness is. Can you share a little bit about what homelessness was like for you? Absolutely. So it's the strongest memories that I have is my mom had um, a community. So if we were homeless, if rent wasn't paid um, prior to her getting Section 8, so there was a period of time where we were together 
about four years before she had Section 8, well, like zero to four for me, um, where she did not have Section 8, where rent was really hard. So we would stay with family or friends um, of hers because she was in her early 20s. She had me when she was 20. Um, she, I was there when she got her first car. You know, she got her first car at 25. So she was just trying to build. Um, and honestly, I don't think people think enough about family homelessness. I think there was a movie a few years ago um, about this family in Florida that was living out of a hotel. Um, you know, we've lived out of domestic, you know, shelters for domestic violence and even things like that. People don't understand that when you leave situations that are unsafe, that usually, even if you do have a backup plan, the backup plan is just to survive, not necessarily um, to thrive. So I've had like, I've stayed in shelters with my mom. And then when, um, when I ended up graduating high school, we were homeless at that time. And I ended up going to college just so I could have a place to stay for nine months out of the year. And that would be one less mouth for my mom to feed. So it's like those kind of trade-offs that you have to make. Even though I went to a private school and I don't know if it was like necessarily the most <laughs> financially conscious decision I made. I mean, 18 year olds spending away their lives for like $60,000 is pretty serious. Um, but for me, it was like a matter of home or no home. And I chose to be comforted for nine months out of the year and I had to trade that off with schoolwork and then being having ADHD, getting the schoolwork done was hard enough. I think the movie you're referring to is The Florida Project, which is one of my yes. all-time favorite movies. With Willem Dafoe, right? <laughs> robbed of the Oscar. Robbed of the Oscar. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he was. He did great. Um, also, the best child acting I think I've ever seen outside of maybe Kavanjane Wallace. Um, another, that should have been an Oscar nomination, but that's neither here nor there. Um <laughs> But you're totally right that I think the version of homelessness that a lot of people see, for example, here in the on the streets of New York City, um, that is obviously one iteration of it. But I think a lot of people don't realize that it takes a lot of forms. And in many cases, you might be at a workplace working alongside someone who is themselves experiencing homelessness. Um, that's just not something that necessarily shows up in their day to day life, probably in part because they take great pains to hide it um, and to seem uh, quote unquote normal. Um, you know, I, I can only imagine that the experience of knowing what was happening in your family's finances, what your mom and siblings were going through, having the reality of homelessness kind of in the background, and then simultaneously attending an expensive private elite university, um, there's probably just like a lot of cognitive dissonance. And I can also imagine that you probably felt uh, that you probably felt rather alienated from a lot of the the students at your school. Can you talk about what that experience was like? Yes. <laughs> Um, something I'm still unpacking. I like to say that I went to college and I got a degree, not a career. So um, I went to school. I went to a private Christian college, actually. And with me being a Black queer woman, um, that was also very interesting, uh, just in general, uh, ring by spring type of situations where people would have like their weddings paid for their junior and senior year. And I didn't even understand that people got married. <laughs> Um, and that was like one way to like, um, I think it's like get your generational wealth or combine wealth and things like that. So I was going to school with really elite kids and um, a lot of international students. So my school was $35,000 a year. But if you were an international student, you've paid like a premium of like at least $3,000 more plus health insurance. So I was going to school with people who were very well off. And for myself, I wore the same clothes every day because partially autism, I have a thing with sensory. So I was wearing the same clothes every day. They were clean, but you know, um, and really when you get into the classroom, when you get into social, social work classrooms and you're surrounded by people who have never experienced homelessness, not even family homelessness, like you, you kind of put in a place where it's like, do I need to share my experience so that people know that there's somebody in this classroom who has legitimately dealt with homelessness and that it's not just some, you know, concept of people just are homeless. Um, so I had to put myself out there a lot because um, especially in my social work courses to be able to like say like, you know, um, 
food stamps, this is actually how they work. Like people actually don't get as much as they need. <laughs> people get $15 on a, on a stamp card and that might be all they get for the month. Um, and so trying to like explain that to other students who have literally like, who had a maybe a sweet 16 and a car bought for them on their 16th birthday when I had never dreamed of even having a car on my 16th birthday. <laughs> Well, one thing we've covered before on the channel is kind of the difference between being broke and being poor. And I think for a lot of people, college is where that is most visible because you're like, you're going out with people who are like, oh, like I've bought so much Chipotle this week. Like I'm so broke. And meanwhile, you're like having to send money that you earn on your on-campus job back to family members so they don't get, you know, kicked out of their house. And it's just the, the level of unspoken inequality that you have to, I mean, it's always at a peak in, in this country, but in such a concentrated environment where people are confusing those terms, it's it's maddening. It is. I even um, had a conversation with one of my RAs and I was like, yeah, literally all the clothes that I have are free. When um, I was wearing a specific uh, sweatshirt, it was like a pink Adidas sweatshirt. And we got that from the Salvation Army for our Christmas gifts. So that winter, we had gotten Christmas gifts from the Salvation Army. Of course, my siblings got toys, but they're like, what do you get for a 17-year-old girl? Clothes. So I was wearing like a sweater that I had never purchased, but that somebody with a good heart had decided, you know, this will be good for somebody's family, right? You mentioned earlier that the period of financial stability that you experienced growing up was when your mother was um, had a new partner who um was obviously beneficial financially but was not good emotionally you know just sort of basically creating a framework where financial stability and personal happiness or safety are kind of mutually exclusive or you can have one without the other um and maybe sometimes you know there there might have been moments of having you know both at the same time but generally speaking it was kind of one or the other um can you talk a little bit about unpacking that dynamic in your adult life Yes, I got married last year. Um, my partner is Congrats. very, thank you. My partner is very fabulous. Like they, um, they understand money, their parents. Um, again, there's that difference between broken poor. Like my family didn't have a home, but their family was, was house, quote unquote, house poor. So they, they had a home. So they always had a place to go back to. And so for them, there's like been um, an aspect of, of growth in terms of like being able to save. And for me, I don't think saving was ever a concept that I was able to fully grasp because it's when you get something, you have to push it out. When you get something, like when you get $50, you hold on to that $50. And then when there's an emergency, you use that $50. You never have anything in savings because if you have a savings, that means that something else is not getting paid. Mm -hmm. um, and the trade-off that I really started to understand, and I, I don't blame my mom. I'm actually very grateful. I don't think that without her marrying her partner at that time, I would have even got into college because there was that period of stability that allowed me to get my grades up and to, I mean, not even get my grades up. I was there for nine years, but, you know, allowed me that time to, um, even know what college was uh, and their family, they were from a, his family, excuse me, um, they were very well off, very middle-class since the eighties because uh, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where I'm from, most people who are in their sixties are um, retired from General Motors or Ford. Um, so they were very stable. I, decided early on that money wasn't going to be my purpose wasn't going to wasn't going to be the thing that I chased but it's something that I needed to achieve my dreams and so when I got to college I traded my um, English degree for a social work degree because I thought it would get me more money in the long run and that really hasn't been the case <laughs> um you know one thing I'm I'm always really interested in hearing from people who have a lot of barriers between themselves and financial stability, but who are very interested in it. I mean, you mentioned that you are just personally interested in it, kind of almost as a hobby, like it's something that you like to to think about and learn about, which I think is true of most of us in this community. Um, otherwise, why would you be watching a financial channel? But um, 
You know, I think there are certain people for whom money becomes almost like a game because, you know, it's something that you can sort of conceptualize that way. And other people for whom they're, you know, they're able to really transfer a very high level of, um, I don't want to say obsession because that sounds negative, but they become very focused on it. Um, and I'm, I'm always really interested to hear how people who have those barriers to financial security, how they balance kind of being gentle with themselves and accepting limitations while still striving to have a lot of agency and to take ownership of their financial situation. Yeah, for me, it's been a long time coming. Um, I think that Vivian too was recently um, on the podcast and I really appreciate Vivian saying like I had that she got into her role. She had a mentor who looked like her. Um, and I think that for me, I don't have any of those role models of people who look like me, who I can look up to, who have maybe the stability that I want in the way that I have thought it out. And um, it's been really eye-opening um, to get this diagnosis and then realize that a lot of stuff like, you know, having dyscalculia, that's a learning disability. That's, that's not necessarily something that I can necessarily control, but what I can control is my attitude towards money. And so some of the things that you have talked about on the podcast and uh, Tiffany Aliche has talked about, and, you know, folks have talked about is kind of coming at money from a perspective of, um, instead of for me, a, a period of scarcity from a scarcity mindset into like an abundance mindset, which is like very woo woo, very manifesty. But also I think that it makes a lot of sense to come at it from a, a mindset of it won't always be this hard. Um, at some point you will get over that hump. And so I'm starting to really knock over some of those hurdles um, towards financial stability. And I think that the pivot point for me was finding out how much I wasn't making. And now that I know that I've never made 35K in my life, I can venture towards that 40K, towards that 50K, towards that 60K with a clarity of mind. Well, e you're a social worker by trade, as you, as you said, and that is one of the industries. So we hear a lot from our audience who are in let's say passion or cause industries, you know, nonprofits, social work, academia, you know, uh, political uh, organizing, all of those kind of things where there's often a huge passion component, but there's also often a sense that you are here for something greater than yourself and that your own personal financial stability should be, um, let's just say not really considered the way it is at, at most jobs. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, in, in your career, you've never, you've never earned over $35,000 a year, which is, you know, for, for most people, that's barely a living wage. Um, you know, how do you, what is your outlook on feeling compelled by the work that you do and needing to advocate for your own financial health? At this time, even like knowing that it is okay to ask for a raise, that it's actually normal to expect a raise. It's it's normal to negotiate your wage. Um, I've been in organizations and, and in jobs where it's like you feel afraid because they're constantly talking about the fact that they don't have money for this or they don't have money for that. Um, but you still see like, oh, we have a new printer. I wonder where the money came for that, right? Um, Honestly, it has to be about those, a lot of those organizations too, like they are also coming from a place of scarcity. So for example, the nonprofit sector is really huge here and everybody's competing for the same pots of money. Everybody wants um, money from the foundations and money from the state and all that stuff. Once you get that, you have to also look at who is working for you. And so for me, it's going to be not working here. <laughs> um, I'm actually transitioning out of the nonprofit sector here in, in Grand Rapids, in West Michigan specifically, and looking for um, statewide and national nonprofits because they pay more. And I think other folks are gonna to have to start doing that too, because um, 
you end up being pigeonholed into certain wage wages here. Um, and I don't think that that's fair for anybody, especially when you're overworked. And so I've tended to be in that overworked and underpaid, and I'm trying to be paid for the work that I do um, rather than um, wishing I was comfortable and also being in the same boat as my clients. As someone who's been very active on the internet for the past decade plus, more years than I would like to admit, and has put a lot of my personal life out for the public to consume, I'm always thinking about how that could make me vulnerable in some ways. And it's not just people like me who have a public platform. For all of us, the data that we have just kind of lingering around the internet can have real consequences if the wrong people get a hold of it. I'm personally making an effort this year to be smarter about my tech and data habits, and that's why I'm thrilled to have our friends from Delete Me back with us for this season of TFC. As you know, all season long here on TFC, we'll be chatting with relatable guests who have dealt with or are currently going through a wide range of personal and financial issues. While many of these hardships could never have been avoided due to circumstance, it's important to do what you can to protect yourself in the situations you do have control over. That's why I personally recommend and actually use Delete Me. I remember the first time I got my Delete Me report, I was completely shocked at how many places my data had gotten to without me realizing it. I felt very vulnerable, honestly, the first time I looked at it, but after that I felt very empowered because I knew I was finally doing something about it. And as some of you might remember earlier this year, my Twitter got hacked, so I was especially coming off of a time where I wanted to be extra cautious about my internet safety. And the report made me feel like I was doing the right thing. You don't realize how much of your information is available to scammers and people with ill intent on the internet, and unfortunately how susceptible you and your family are to identity theft and fraud. But now you can get your data removed with Delete Me. Delete Me is a subscription service that removes your personal info from the largest people search databases on the web, and in the process helps prevent identity theft, doxing, and phishing scams. Delete Me finds and removes the personal information you don't want online, and makes sure it stays off. Sign up and provide Delete Me with exactly what information you want deleted, and their experts will take it from there. Delete Me sends you regular personalized privacy reports showing what they found, where they found it, and what they removed. Delete Me isn't just a one-time service. They're always working for you, constantly monitoring and removing the personal information you don't want on the internet. Take control of your data and keep your private life private by signing up for Delete Me now at a special discount for our listeners. Today, get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you go to joindeleteme.com slash TFC and use promo code TFC at checkout. The only way to get 20% off is to go to joindeleteme.com slash TFC and enter code TFC at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash TFC, code TFC. If there's one thing that we've learned over the past 12 months here at TFD is that sales of really any kind, but especially B2B sales can be incredibly difficult, especially in this current environment where you're never really sure if we're in a pandemic or not, or in a recession or not, or generally what's going on. So it's particularly fitting that today's sponsor for this episode is LinkedIn. Let's talk about LinkedIn Sales Navigator for a minute. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a sales intelligence platform fueled by LinkedIn's 1 billion member platform that helps professionals effectively prospect and engage customers, ultimately increasing sales performance. Sales Navigator helps you target the right customers, surface key signals such as job changes or which accounts you should prioritize, and shows you hidden allies so you can find those buyers that are most likely to convert. Sales Navigator gives you the most up-to-date, first-party data, enabling you to unlock conversations with the people that matter. From search filters to list management, analytical capabilities, and accurate, up-to-date profiles, Sales Navigator can save you time and make your job more efficient. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash TFD. That is linkedin.com slash TFD for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. Just go to linkedin.com slash TFD and get started. When it comes to the workplace specifically, what are things that you wish more people knew about working with someone um, or managing someone or whatever it may be who who has ADHD specifically? So for like managing my, somebody like myself, um, I I have tried to get this at every workplace since even before I knew I had ADHD. So since like 2018, um, I need you to email me instructions or let me write them down because I will forget. And not only will I forget, I will forget what... Um, the priority of the thing that you've asked me to do. 
and I will also forget the the gist of what it is actually about. So um, going to Job Accommodation Network has been helpful for me to know, okay, for me, I need you to write things down. I don't need you to repeat yourself, but also you have to train me well out of the gate. And you can't just train me by telling me things. I need, I need paper, um, like with instructions, I need um, how to's and all of those different kinds of things because um, it's not that I don't know how to do my job. I can do my job, whether you how, however you teach me, but it's the learning curve. How long will it take me to do my job? How long will it take me to understand how to do my job? Especially when you're starting in a new place. I've had jobs where they're like, okay, um, just stand up front and people will ask you questions and then they don't give you any, any answers to those questions. So you have to go run around finding people. So I just had a flashback of an old job. <laughs> um, and as far as the money management component, um, specifically with ADHD, what are some of the workarounds that you found for kind of managing yourself about your money habits? Yes, I only use my, I, I should only use a credit card, but I can also forget to pay that credit card. So I only use debit cards for right now until I can understand how to um, use, like how to how to remember my money. So I save all my receipts. I use a debit card so I can trace what I had purchased. Um, and then for me, uh, there's a bunch of different savings accounts that I have to use and then switch things over. So automation is really important when you have ADHD because if you see something, you're going to assume that you have it. And it's not, I mean, I think anybody's just going to assume that they have it. If you see it in your checking account, you're going to assume it's there for you to use. But if for me, I have to automate all of my checking and savings accounts so that my savings is automatic and not something I have to actually do because just the step, there's like, you have to get over that hurdle of like, okay, I have to transfer the money. Okay, I need to log into my account and then I need to transfer the money. Okay, but then you forget what you were doing when you started, um, which is a lot of a lot of things happen when you a lot of the issue is forgetting what you were doing when you started as well. <laughs> um, you know, one of the like whenever our audience is talking like in the comments or in our discord about um, money management tips is like how many of them feel like like they assume that you already have money to manage, basically. Like you need a certain amount to even start doing anything, um, which I think is true, right? And I think it's also exponential. I think the more money you have, the easier it is to be good at money and the more um, you know, unique and creative ways that you that are available to you to make good money decisions. Um, you know, I know that you mentioned um but, you know, you've you've not earned more than thirty five thousand, you have the student debt, you know, you're uh where it's not even a question of should be financially, but um, you're definitely in a place in, in now your 30s where you don't have a lot of the same tools to get to a good place financially that other people do. Can you talk about how you view and work on money management when working with very little? So people think that there's not a, skill, a lot of skills that come out of poverty. You, you learn a lot when you are poor. You learn how to rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, and you know, um, that's what my mom used to call it. And then also like, uh, you know who to call. You know, you can call the DTE and consumers and say, hey, I don't have the money. I need to put, a, I need to put this on a payment plan. Um, for example, my student loans, I signed up for not deferment, but like the new save plan um, because I know that they're going to want to see something even if I don't have it. But at least if I uh, apply for like the save plan, then there's like a, a portion that I um, is, is more feasible for me to pay. And so you start to understand the system even more than most people. So um, understanding how to get food stamps, um, understanding where to get housing, who to get housing from, like you just kind of, when you live with little, when you, when you, when you live with very little, when you're coming from a place of scarcity, 
you learn to ask for help. And if you don't ask for help, you are going to drown. Um, that's how my mom was able to survive. She asked like, hey, can I stay with you? Can I stay with you? You know, doing what she had to do. And for me right now, even though I have zero dollars in my savings account, I still know that it's going to be me applying for jobs and applying for jobs out like way applying for jobs that even um that things come in time um I hope that makes sense but like just the patience that you have to have when you're poor <laughs> is is really high you have a lot of patience um because things are not just given to you um quickly if that makes sense so, I mean, patience has been the most important piece of me, even like coming into my financial um, understanding, if that makes sense. I don't know, that might be the wordy. No, no, it makes total sense. I mean, I, I think also a lot of it, um, I, w I would be really interested to, to know how you feel like your, how your mental health has changed since getting your diagnoses. I was um, diagnosed with major depression, um, probably right out of college. I definitely experienced major depression my entire life. And um, since getting my diagnoses last May, my depression, it was pretty severe still, but it's starting to alleviate. I think that when you don't feel like you're the, when you don't feel like everything is your fault or you're the problem or you're the root of all issues in your life. Um, you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, like mm -hmm. this isn't gonna be life forever. I think that prior to getting my diagnoses, I was in the dark often and um, didn't see any way out. So I didn't see any way out financially. I didn't see any way out educationally. I didn't see any way out like emotionally and so kind of now having a better understanding and a better grip of what my symptoms look like I'm able to actually sit down with myself and talk it out even with my partner like okay like I'm going to be um how do I say this I'm going to be um mm, extra careful this month because of um, my symptoms are really high or something like that. But also getting on medication, I think that actually that's the real answer is once I got on the stimulant medication, my brain woke up and that's where the light at the end of the tunnel for me has been. Yeah, I think that's the real answer. You know, maybe, I don't know, everyone's different, but I always feel like in our generation, part of the mental health awakening for ourselves as individuals is often like a mental health awakening toward previous generations and being like, what was going on with you guys? <laughs> like <laughs> my, my platform as, as many of you might know, presidentially is get every boomer in therapy, um, mandated. <laughs> Maybe we can throw some meds in there for a lot of them. But point being is that I think a, a lot of times we were often raised with very poor mental health frameworks because for prior generations, there, that just wasn't even really a thing. You know, it wasn't considered, it wasn't treated, taken seriously, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and especially coming from a background of so much turmoil financially, emotionally, structurally, all of that, how has learning about yourself affected the way you look back at memories, the way you look at other people in your life? Like, how has it affected that part of things? I realized that I wasn't a bad kid. Mm. So I actually went and I contacted my elementary school and I was like, I need those records from fifth grade. It was a rough year. I need to know what happened. <laughs> and um, it said like, you know, doesn't understand math concepts, gets frustrated, throws fits, cries. And I'm like, yeah, I remember that. Okay. Um, then I looked down and it said like, Nikita has a problem with her attitude. And for me, I didn't think I had a problem with, I thought I was just a bad kid. And so I just thought, you know, I'm just a bad kid. I'll never be any better than, than I am today at 10 years old. <laughs> and um, since like working towards um, 
like a better mental health framework, I realized, no, I wasn't a bad kid. Um, I wasn't given the tools necessary to be able to excel. And so there's a difference between just like having an idea about somebody, but then giving them the tools. And so I feel like over these last few years, over this last year for me, it's all been about gathering the tools and knowing what they're used for. Because you can have a toolbox and it just be dusty. But for me, I have the tools. I know which tools to use. And um, it's way more clearly, it's way more clear now what tools to use that could have been, you know, more helpful back then. But it's also like, don't be upset just because your toolbox was empty. Like you, you use those 30 years to get the tools and now you're coming back into yourself and that is okay. So just resting in like, not feeling like the bad kid for your whole life or forever. You know, I'm so gl- grateful for my diagnosis. If I didn't have it, I don't think I would um, even be speaking with you. I'd probably be still at my old job, um, crying over my clients and feeling bad for myself. That is okay. So the like retroactively changing how you think about your younger self is so real because for me, it was that I, like I was always labeled lazy growing up. Like I was always told I was so lazy. And to be fair, I had terrible grades. So I do understand the like logic there, but then like it took me so long into adulthood and I am objectively not a lazy person. And, but it took me years and years and years of exhibiting objectively not lazy behavior to be like, oh, I'm actually not lazy. But the, still there was a long period of time where I was like, well, I guess I changed and I'm not lazy anymore. And then I went back and thought about it. And I was like, in high school, yeah, I got bad grades, but like I learned another language. I wrote like four plays. Like I did like all these extracurricular activities. Like I had like a very robust, creative intellectual life. And I was really dedicated to all different kinds of projects. They just weren't the projects that we were working on in class. And I do think that like a lot of people would benefit from doing that same analysis in the sense that the lessons that you have from, because ultimately the way you kind of operate as a child, that's the way you work. That's the way, that's what your brain likes to do. That's the the way things feel natural and accessible to you. Those are the pathways that are just, you know, most productive for you. And I feel like there's so many lessons to be learned and ways to better manage yourself by understanding how you operated even then, you know? Absolutely. I was an avid reader. I was writing every day. I was listening to my, you know, listening to CDs upon CDs and just writing and writing and writing and writing. And yet somehow I still felt lazy. One of my favorite books is Laziness Does Not Exist by Dr. Devin Price. Mm -hmm. uh, Because, you know, laziness doesn't exist. I think we just live in a world that's expecting so much of you and giving you so little in return. That doesn't really make a lot of sense to, yeah. I always like, I'm always, uh, Uh, like amused and angry when I read those articles that are like people in the middle ages only worked like four hours a day or something like that. Like there's just, (laughs) there's just like a lot of really good evidence. And I mean, it's especially accelerated since like the rise of the computer where like theoretically we need to be working less than ever before because we're so much more efficient um, and so much more productive. And yet we work longer and longer hours. And it's just gotten to this point where if you're not constantly obsessed with one specific and it's not even just work in general right because there's so much work outside of our professional careers but if we're not obsessed with that one really narrow part of human life then there's something deficient about us yeah i think that we need to um i think it's the three like um sleep work and hobbies or something like oh it's i don't think enough people have hobbies it's it's eight hours for rest, eight hours for work, eight hours for whatever you will or something like that. It's like the socialist manifesto or whatever. I, well, source source needed on that one, but I get what you're saying. Um, so, OK, so you're you've got your diagnoses. You've uh, gotten married again. Congratulations. You are making all these kind of big pivots in your life. Um, 
you know, one of the themes of a lot of the people I'm talking to this season is sort of starting over and, and feeling a little bit reborn in your adult life. You know, talking to people who, um, you know, completely changed careers in their 40s or who came out as, as queer much later in life or who made these really big changes. And so you obviously are someone who's making a lot of these really big changes on many different fronts all at once at the age of 30, going on 31. Um, I'd love to hear just kind of your outlook on you know, what it means to essentially have this second youth a little bit at the age you are now. Yeah, it feels like I'm going through puberty again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Puberty the first time was rough enough. I don't I don't think that's for me. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it feels like when you are looking at life with new eyes, that you see all of the things that could have and should have and you realize that somehow you can still make them happen mm -hmm. and so I am in that period of I can still make this happen like very everything I think it's uh the, the movie with Michelle Yeoh everything all together everything everywhere all at once <laughs> yes <laughs> um and that's how I feel and that's one of my favorite movies because I'm just like I'm realizing like there are so many infinite possibilities for myself now. I'm not just pigeonholed into um, bad homeless kid with um, you know a math disorder. I am Nikita. I am you know I love pink. I love travel. I love writing, and I'm actually rediscovering my love of writing all over again because it's something that I kind of pushed down because I was so tired and burnt out from work. That I just didn't have the energy to do. And so in the meantime, I've been writing and kind of rediscovering myself through my words again. And it's been really just beautiful and just relieving even uh, if, is, is another word I would use for it. Um, yeah. What would your advice be to someone who feels like they have a specific uh, neuroatypicality, but are not in a space to get a diagnosis right now? I wasn't in the space for a long time as well. Um, I think that probably the best bet would be gathering all your sources, you know, so that you can read them over. That's kind of how I do. I go into Google Drive and I just put a bunch of things together and then I reread them. And then I try to get um, kind of like a central thesis around it. And um, I think that if, if you're working with just your brain with little diagnoses or no diagnoses or even misdiagnoses, like I feel like a lot of people should just know that like that's not their fault. Timing is everything. And um, I think for myself being able to like, I think for me, I think the best bet is just like timing is everything. Um, like you don't have to rush everything. You don't have to rush the healing. It's going to time all, you know, time takes, it takes time to heal and things like that. Um, yeah. Just kind of as a final question for you, um, you know, and especially again, not to put you in the space of being the advice giver for everyone who might be in this position, because I know that like, you know, mental health is ultimately a, a fingerprint, right? Like everyone's is completely unique and, you know, what works for you is not necessarily going to be able to work for, for someone else. But one thing I really, I think a lot of people want to hear and, and look to, to people who have, you know, sort of found a better path for themselves is how do you stay optimistic enough when things are going really bad to get you to the place um, where things have a chance of getting better. Like in your situation, I think about, you know, when you were in major, when you were having a major depressive episode and it's difficult to even brush your teeth or put on a clean shirt, how did you find the motivation and the, the logistical framework to get to the place that you're at now while in that, in that episode? Yeah, I found people, um, people who were, very similar to me or very different from me who had different ideas about life. I also found creators online who I could um, connect to on like 
a spiritual level or like a intellectual level, um, comedic, you know, humor, you know. So I think um, that with as vast as this world is, if you can't find a person like in your area or in your town, you can find somebody online who's probably talking about a similar experience that, that they're having. And for me, YouTube has been a lifesaver because I've been able to just um, listen to other people's stories and realize that I'm not a I'm not alone in everything that I do, and I'm not alone as like a person that we're kind of all connected and and all that, you know, nice jazz. And so, um, when I was in my deepest darkest hour, I will say. I always had something that brought me joy. And so usually um, for me, that was like a Korean variety show where they're smiling the whole time and just getting like a little piece of something that brings you joy to get you through like that dark time. For me, it was YouTube. For others, it could be, I don't know, um, cooking or baking or things like that. Well, this conversation has brought me joy, um, and I really love uh, getting to speak with you, um, especially when you're at such a such an exciting time in your life. Um, for people who would like to learn more about you and follow what you're doing, where should they go? Um, I would love for folks to head over to my blog. It's called Life is Always Under Construction. Um, it's uh, via Substack, and uh, you can also find me um, uh, my, my writing name is Ren Wordsmith and you can find me on Instagram at Ren Wordsmith if that's something that you would like to do as well. Well, all that will be linked below and shout out for having a blog because I feel like I love video. I love watching video, but I love to read and I feel like not enough people are writing down their thoughts these days. Yes. Let's process. Let's process. Um, all right. Well, thank you again so much for joining and thank you guys at home for tuning in. And I will see you next Monday back here on an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us and be sure to tune in next week for an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. The Financial Confessions is created by the Financial Diet and hosted by me, Chelsea Fagan. It is produced by Alexa Brooks Major and Holly Trantham. Recording and editing by Emily Fisher and music and sound effects are from Epidemic Sound. Want more of our content? Head over to our YouTube page, The Financial Diet, to see our monthly deep dives, videos of this show, and our entire backlog of videos and podcasts. I'll talk to you next week.